I'm your host, Keith Waits. And you just heard a little recording thing there. Uh, Cause I gotta tell you, uh, we, uh, we, I have Bob Howard and Meg Higgins on today. And I will just explain to you first that uh, they were gonna come in the studio into the beautiful studio built by Sean Selby. And we were going to do it here. And uh, Bob had, had an accident. He's okay, he's okay. But he's, he's, uh, he, he had a small accident that just it makes it hard to move around and so we didn't want to we didn't want to make him drive in here and sit in this uh in this beautiful studio so we're doing it from zoom we're doing it through zoom first time for this show uh i did zoom i recorded zoom for three years keeping going during the pandemic but this is the first time i've brought people in live in the studio so um let me just tell you a little bit about them first off the reason why we are talking at this moment in time is that uh bob and meg who uh have been married have been together a very long time very happy pair. Uh, they uh, ha, uh, they are in a show together right now called Nothing in Common that is at the Klein Helter Gallery over in New Albany. Uh, beautiful space. Ray is a terrific painter, but also a master carpenter and craftsman, and he he fashioned this space himself. So it's really beautiful. It's up through June third. Uh, so they've come to talk about it. We were I was in the gallery. They gave me a little tour of the show the other day. So let me just tell you, Meg Higgins received two individual artist grants from the Kentucky Foundation for Women and is well known for Facing 50 at Gallery Hertz, an invitational show where the challenged 50 artists and writers to take a fresh look at stereotypes of aging. Meg has taught art history as an adjunct professor at Bellarmine College. She's also a writer and communications professional, and she's produced award-winning films, programs, and communication materials. And uh, Bob Hauer, uh, who was on the show once before with uh, his professional partner, Ted Wathen, about the Kentucky documentary photographic project. Uh, he is a little photographer who was born in Boston, uh, graduated from Middlebury College, studied photography at both MIT and Harvard. He taught photography at Wright State University for four years and is a founding partner of Quadrant, a commercial photography studio located outside of Louisville, Kentucky. He uh, is currently engaged with Ted Wathen and John Nation in photographing the creation of the Parklands of Floyd's Fork in Louisville, Kentucky. So needless to say, both of these guys have game, and uh, they're here to talk about though this particular exhibit. Bob and Meg, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Keith. Good intro. Thank you. <laughs> well, you know, I just take it from people's websites and stuff, you know, and I kind of, I kind of sometimes uh, will narrow it down a little bit. Uh, you long intros don't always play well on the radio. You want to get into the, the conversation. So, so. Um, we're doing this from Zoom, and I can see uh, your lovely home. So uh, let's uh, so let's uh, let's start with talking about the exhibit um, at Klein Helter. Uh, I want you each. Uh, Meg, will, I'll let you go first. Uh, talk a little bit about the work as a whole that you have in the gallery. What what people might expect to see when they go uh, to uh, Klein Helter and do this show? Okay. Um, well, it's work that I've done over the past few years um, and um, mainly it's uh, some a technique that I learned uh, at Penland School of Craft in um, North Carolina a few years ago and it's using plaster on wood as uh, a substrate and then uh, images are um, either stenciled or painted or uh, image transfers on on that surface and the plaster surface um, takes color so beautifully um, that I really love it and color is a really important element to me in all of my work uh, it's kind of it's to me that's the juicy part um, <laughs> um, you know bringing together colors that you might normally not see together, but then finding the bridge, the color bridge that um, makes it magic. And um, I use a lot of um, nature images. Um, the you saw in the gallery as you're coming in on the right. Um, I have a series that. I've worked on over the past couple of years that I call Miraculous Mortals, which um, is uh, using anatomical drawings that um, Bob has copied off of a poster that I have. 
and um, and I, I wanted to use anatomical drawings because I think they're so beautiful. And I thought, what could I possibly add to these that would make them even more beautiful or, or make them be seen in a new light? And um, I, a friend had sent me some pressed leaves from Vermont and I, I just threw various um, back and forth trying to make them work together. It, it just sort of became, um, they really spoke to each other. The, the leaf and flower reference with the anatomical drawings, um, they, I, I wanted to make a statement about nature nurturing the human body um, right. as well as it being really beautiful, I thought. <laughs> Well, and, you know, and I, I was, you know, thinking about those images now, uh, and when we were talking about them, you know, they, they actually, they do, they, they, they blend together very well. Um, you know, there's something about the, the, you know, they're two organic forms, and you kind of think, you know, I mean, a lot of people wouldn't think a leaf has anything to do with human form, but something about the colors and textures that you were using inside those anatomical drawings, they really match up with those leaves beautifully. And they seemed such a perfect blend. Uh -huh. So I use I make reference to nature a lot in my work. Um, I, I have animals um, and flowers, trees, uh, and it's all done in a stylized way. Um, and um, I I really work to find things that come together and I guess that's one of the most creative parts about what I do is um, finding images that I for me have some kind of visual impact and then matching it with other images that don't necessarily would necessarily go together um, to create a composition that's full of color and I, I hope um, people see them other than just what they are on the surface because I put a lot of thought and hopefulness into to what I do. Um, I want to project something that's positive but also really beautiful and interesting. Um, and so it's, it's like any artist, you know, I, I don't know exactly how it's gonna turn out until I've been through the process of, um, you know, so, sport and stuff and- Right. Uh, so you're hopeful for the human species that, that so. we will survive all, all of our attempts to destroy ourselves. <laughs> well, that, I would really like that. If my yeah. art could uh, <laughs> turn that one around, I'd be really happy. Um, Yes, but I, I just feel like there's so much negativity and awful darkness out there that uh, mm -hmm. this is just a little spot of light and enthusiasm, um, and um, and I, you know I hope that people can find some depth to them as well, besides um, just uh, dismissing them as just pretty pictures. Okay. Well, Bob, let's bring you in and the same question. How would you describe, and I, I know when we were talking, you you use the word retrospective, and I don't know if that's entirely uh, appropriate, but it does seem true that the work you have sort of looks back. You know, all of Meg's things seem to have been, it's like, it's her re more recent practice. It's probably a few years or whatever of that work coming together, but talk about what you have in the gallery. Yeah, so uh, I, I, I've said that word retrospective, and I, I call it kind of a media retrospective because uh, it's not really, I, I could do a much bigger show that would mm -hmm. be a, a bigger, better, maybe better retrospective. But uh, a lot of my career, I have really focused on what comes next, what, what I want to do next, the current work without ever, I wouldn't say without ever, but often kind of thinking, 
okay, you've done all these pictures and they're kind of in the bag and they're done and they're good. And you can, you'll, we'll look at them later and I'll get them out and show them to people later. And I've just forged ahead. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I am hard to believe 76 years old. And um, when this opportunity came up, I thought, you know, this would be a lot of fun to go back over my whole career and look at what's there and, you know, see, see how good it is and see what it is. And so uh, this exhibit is, as you point out, largely uh, in the, you know, it's largely thing, many things from a long time ago, <clears throat> largely film-based. So the first part of the process for me was going through all my negatives and picking out ones I wanted to scan, scanning them, making fresh prints, which uh, is a lot of fun. I still really love to print. And then uh, framing them, matting them, and getting them ready to, uh, you know, to, to hang. So um, it's an interesting process. I, I really wanted, that's our dog in the background who hasn't had his walk yet today. Um, I really wanted to give a chance. I realized that I've had you know, a number of shows here. Chaos is happening here. A number of shows <laughs> here, but, it, but it's been a while. And uh, I sort of felt that a lot of my friends and people that know me really don't know what I've done. And, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, so I wanted to show people, this is, this is what I believe in. This is what I've been doing all my life for the most part. Obviously, there's a lot of things in life that don't involve art making, but and a lot of some art making that is more commercial oriented than this. But this is this is my life. This is my work. This is really you know, who I am. And uh, I wanted to show people that. I wanted people to know, and I, I think I'm right about that. People, a lot of people haven't seen any or many of these pictures, so that was kind of how I approached it. I hadn't seen any of them. I I don't believe uh, you know. And there are things that are reminiscent of images I've seen, but everything seemed to be, it was new in the sense that I hadn't seen it before, even if it was something from 1971 or 1980 or whatever, um, they were new. Um, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Well, good. I'm glad to hear that. I think that's yeah. true for me. The, um, you know, I should talk a little bit about my sort of, you know, one of the things I, I find, and I'd be willing to bet a number of artists have this, is that I've always been very critical of myself in one way or another, comparing myself to others and, you know, kind of my inner voice saying, you know, you're not doing enough, you haven't done enough. And I look back, when I look back over this big pile of negatives, I said, you know what, you actually have done a lot. And, uh, right. and you've also been, I have also been uh, very dogged in my determination. And, uh, in the end, I have a pretty big pile of pictures. So uh, Because you kept telling yourself you're not doing enough. Exactly. <laughs> right because and that's i you know i see that as a healthy thing for an artist and, and I, I often yeah. say like you know uh, everybody i've talked to here is like people are never quite satisfied artists are never quite satisfied they are always they always have an itch to scratch um and i think basically you, you know when you die you cannot work but you're going to do yeah. stuff and yeah. art is something that you can do for a long time you may have to change some of your methods you know, because, you know, you get arthritis and, you know, you stop working with certain kinds of things and you work with other things that, 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 that are okay, you know, and you just find ways to make art and art, artists will do that. I don't, I think retirement is a, is a funny concept to artists, not to people in a business, but to, to artists, I don't think they ever stop. Yeah. Well, I, I should maybe also say that, you know, I, I came to photography when I was in college and I really had not had a great deal of interest in art prior to that. And, but I, I also kept asking myself in, in the way that I think younger people do, it's like, Ooh, I don't even know who I am. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It was a real a kind of an identity, a missing identity that I hadn't figured out. And so when photography, when I, I a friend of mine uh, started taking pictures and passing pictures around, and I, I really liked them, really responded to them. And so I kind of caught the photography book bug and started you know shooting pictures and making prints and making negatives and making prints from them and um it really was the one thing that really grabbed me and showed me a path for better or for worse it's it's not necessarily a very great career to choose but it was the one thing that uh, really made sense to me and i realize now that i had you know in terms of establishing myself 
and using that as, as a, a photographer identity that um, I was really driven, you know, for whatever mm -hmm. reason. I mean, art is funny. You know, what are your motives? Do you want to be famous? Do you want to do this? Do you want to do that? Um, I didn't ever want to be famous necessarily. You'd like to be recognized. But a lot of what I do and a lot of what these pictures are, I would say they're documentary photographs. Uh, they are a way in which, you know, photography has a way of, of saving things uh, from the dustbin. And yeah. a, lot of, a lot of the pictures you will see in this show, uh, most of the people and most of the places are gone. You know? So a lot of my, my self-stated mission was preservation. So, so that's like uh, thinking about people like Atche, for instance, Eugene Atche, who photographed France and Paris around the turn of the 20th century. Uh, just recording stuff that was being torn down and going away. A lot of people have done this, right? It's kind of a valuable thing. I mean, I don't know that I'm changing the world in any way, but it's uh, they're very interesting things to look at. Well, I think artists are always changing the world, and it's it's not that you're changing the world in some sort of epic, you know, um, way, but we you change your part of the world a little bit, and hopefully the ripples go out. Um, I, but I was thinking about you know when you talk about documenting and preserving did you when you first started doing photography did you think of yourself as an artist or did you think of your was it was it a hobby or was it immediately more important to you like what when did you think of yourself as an artist was it right away or later yeah you know i, I still ask myself that question <laughs> you know is photography art I, I think of myself now as an artist because my my perspective has broadened on, on that definition and i think in a way you know always having that question in front of me. Uh, I don't know, that was kind of a negative train of thought. I guess. So it took a long time for me to consider that I was an artist, but I knew I was a photographer. And uh, I, you know, the other part of it is, is why do you do art, that question? Mm -hmm. It's like, it was a lot of fun. I mean, I had a lot of fun, a lot of fun. I have been to places and seen things that most, most people don't get to. So there's a way in which all of this, you can put whatever high flute and you know, ideals you want, but a lot of it is just art. Art making is and should be anyway, a lot of fun. Right. So what could be more fun than driving around and taking pictures? In my view, not much. <laughs> uh, well, I have to just stop here for a second and remind you, you are listening to WXOXLP in Louisville. It's 97.1 on the dial, artxfm.com to listen uh, through the internet or uh, there's a really easy to use app. And I just want to tell you a couple of things. Commonwealth Theater Center works every day towards a vision of a wise, resilient community transformed by thoughtful and engaged student and adult leaders who have been empowered by the skills and life lessons developed through their time with CTC. To that end, they develop, they, they cultivate confidence, compassion, and courage in students across the greater Louisville area by challenging them to fully engage with live theater in safe and inclusive spaces through a unique combination of educational outreach, student-led performances, and excellence and comprehensive theater training. You can go to ctclou.org to find out more about them or help support them. And uh, their Young American Shakespeare Festival opens, uh, I believe, May 11th. It is the weekend after Derby because every theater in town opens a show the weekend after Derby. It's kind of nuts. Anyway, but uh, so just wanted to tell you about that. And then also, uh, there are so many great shows to uh, listen to uh, on the air here. Um, and I just wanted to tell you that one of them is... Uh, the Blues Highway, Sunday mornings with Mike Suttles, old blues, new blues, all kinds of blues, 9 to 11 a.m. to start your Sunday off here on WXOX 97.1. So uh, I want to get back here, Meg. Uh, so what, you know, Meg, you, you're, you're sort of mixed media or multimedia. You, you work with a lot of different kinds of things. You work with collage. Um, but like, so let's talk about your beginning as an artist. What was the first medium? Were you, were you a painter? Were you... What was your first sort of medium? Um, actually, um, photography, um, I had um, my degree from the University of Louisville is in art history. Uh -huh. And um, after, you know, living in Louisville all my life, I wanted to get out and see the art that I'd been looking at in two dimensions. I wanted to see that third dimension, go to galleries. And 
So um, I started off in New York and then I went to Europe on my own um, with a backpack and uh, a camera. And um, I photographed, um, you know, many things, but a lot of it was sculpture and art. And I think my, I've always had an in, a visual interest in, in anything. And I think photography really um, cultivates that in that you are putting a frame around things, you know, and you're saying this, this thing within this frame is interesting. And um, it can be that way for any number of reasons. But I think, and this is some, a point I wanted to make about um, Bob's work and my work, while we call this nothing in common, that might be the first um, impression. But one of the things that really draws us together is subject matter. We're mm. both interested in content. And um, I mean, neither one of us are, you know, off doing abstract art, which is wonderful. But um, I've just always had a great interest in content. And um, then I, I came back and um, to Louisville and uh, started taking photography classes with Suzanne Mitchell, mm. uh, who was just a fabulous teacher. She had just started at U of L and we really connected. And um, I, my love of photography grew, but she didn't put a lot of emphasis on chemicals and um, the technical side of photography. She said, do whatever you want, you know, if you see an image, if you see two images, you know, cut them up and put them together um, that you like or that, you know, might have greater impact because you're seeing them together than just by themselves. And so that was very liberating. I just got out my scissors and my colored pencils and, um, and also I had I, early on, I started collecting uh, papers, um, handmade papers, uh, vintage papers, um, you know, things that had real texture and color and interest to them. And, um, and I had a little show at uh, Bellarmine College um, that was my um, photographs from Europe images that I cut out and I put them together with different kinds of papers. And then, and then I would draw on them or I often embellish things with, with gold ink. And that was just so play. I mean, it was like Bob said, it was, it's fun. It's so playful right. and still expressive and, and original to, you know, the way I would deal with an image. It goes and back to the snub nose scissors and Elmer's glue when we were kids, right? You know, exactly, just, you know. exactly. And when I was a little girl and people asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I said an artist or a waitress. <laughs> and um, I think I said I wanted to be a waitress was because that's what I saw women doing. And I always mm. loved eating out in restaurants. <laughs> an early age. It's also um, what we often see artists doing when they're yeah. young and <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize how much they went together. Um, but um, and I'm not really sure why I said I wanted to be an artist. It was just a real instinct that uh, early on I didn't have any real role models. Um, and, but art history just really pulled me in. Mm, yeah. And uh, it was a great way to learn about history, but also to cultivate my eye and um, just learn about the history of art in general, which is amazing. Um, well, I wonder if a lot of people interested in history take art history, because I mean, you make a good point, and, and it's often discussed in whole papers and books and things that have been written about how art is the document of a culture, you know um whether it's uh in whatever form including writing you know that's what we know that's the archaeology that informs us of what happened a thousand or two thousand or five thousand years ago um and 
so it seems like art history is uh, you shouldn't get a history degree without having to take art history is what i would say yeah um so you guys were i didn't know that about you because your work in that i've seen you know as as involved imagery and photography but but like sort of found imagery that you transform and things like that so how did you guys meet was it because you were both photographers how did you guys come together um well i never really thought of myself as a photographer i always thought of myself as a manipulator of photography <laughs> so, um we met through friends uh ted and bridget Watkin. um Ooh. both knew them and and they kind of match made us and um which was great but we did we didn't really connect for a couple of years bob was living in dayton at the time mm. and um but i think for me having the experience of just working in photography or imagery um the the importance and significance of imagery to me was um made me interested in what Bob was doing. And, you know, something um, that you didn't mention in my resume is that um, I worked at the LVA for quite a few years. Yes. And um, back in the, the halcyon days with John Bagley in the water tower. Exactly, at the water tower. And um, I remember one of the shows, one of the first shows that was coming the, after I came on board there was this photographer from Ohio, Bob Hauer. And um, I had never been that interested in color photography. You know, I, I just worked in uh, black and white and I, I didn't really, hadn't really seen anybody's work in color that I really liked. But before I even met Bob, I saw his images in, in my gallery. And I was like, oh, this is this is different kind of, you know, this is a different eye or a different um, sensibility than what I've seen in, in other colored photographs. So then Bob came to Louisville and um, for that show. And I don't know, then we did we dated for a few years, but Art was always kind of central to our connection. And another fun thing is like one of our first dates, we went to the Brown Hotel to, oh, what's the name of the restaurant upstairs? Is that the J. Cram or something? Um, yeah, I think so. Anyway, I can't remember exactly. But... Yeah, I should know that. But um, outside of the restaurant, there's this kind of, space where you can have drinks or whatever but they had a collection of these beautiful horse paintings uh in that area and um after we had dinner we went out and we looked at those paintings together and i think we both felt like we really connected um over that experience um that's really beautiful to know that it was it was always art that that pulled you guys together, you know. Because yeah, you, that, that circle the, of friends were yeah. was the the French a lot of what we all had in common was art. So yeah, the, the circle of artists. So so you know, in some ways, nothing in common is a, is almost like a it's it's really kind of a misleading title. <laughs> right. Well, you you want to tell the story yeah. about how, how that how that name came to play, um, right? Because there's a lot of there's a lot of differences in the work, certainly on superficial levels, medium and things like that. But yeah. but go ahead. Well, I was was trying to come up with a name, but I didn't want to push it too hard. I didn't want anything that was seemed silly or too cute or whatever. And we were at an opening at uh, Kleinhelters, and um, I was talking to Peter Morin, and I said. Um, so Bob and I are having a show here. We're having the next show in a few weeks. And he said, huh, nothing in common. And I was like, <laughs> Peter, thank you. <laughs> That's it, nothing in common. Um, you know, and it's it's just kind of a, a fun way of saying, you know, here 
we're mated, but um, right. we're also individuals. And um, But since then, I have thought about it. And I do think that we have that love of subject matter and a narrative. Uh, I mean, you know, both of our things are we're trying to tell stories. Right. And the other thing is, I think, um, color. Like I said, um, I didn't have that much interest in color photography, but once I started looking at it and seeing Bob's work, um, we both love color a lot and use it differently, but I think that's another thing. Well, yeah, and I want to talk, Bob, let's talk about your work a little bit because I th that's absolutely true. You know, things like, uh, there's a, is it a shell station in there? You seem to have done a lot of gas stations over the years. And there's just a couple. I, think, I, can, I can have a, you know, <laughs> a, a decent show of gas station pictures. And I would absolutely love to do that. I mean, that would be well, so much fun. I could do, you know, gas stations, one show, uh, factories would be another show. Uh, I think, uh, I think, power, transmission towers. I think you could have a book of the gas stations too. I think that would go over really well. That's sort that of idea that kind of thing. Can, yeah but but the thing about it is that there's a the color in that shell like that shell station is a thing particularly that one image that's in this show um and you should go see this show you should always whenever we're whenever you're listening to people talk about art or whenever you look and see things on social media or whatever those are great um sort of leads and cues but you should about where you should go but it's extremely important. I preach this. I say this in every show. Bob and I were having this conversation with the guy the other day. You've got to go into the room. You've got to go into the space to view the art. Uh, Mick has books for one thing. So, okay, you, you that you can look at and touch and things like that. But you've got to go and see. And uh, but but part of it is the shell. The getting back to the shell image, the you know that color seems heightened. It seems almost unreal. It's so it has so much punch. And uh, I mean, and and but also I'll I'll talk about let's talk about the bigger images because I want to talk about the one image, but the, but the big images I think go back to what Meg was saying earlier about how you decide you make that frame and you decide and we were talking about this. There's the one image in particular that is was it in a, a was it Ohio an Ohio town where you you were you were up on a vantage point looking down through this small town and behind the small town is some sort of a factory and it's 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 fascinating the 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 relationship in these levels of the town the, the streets as it goes back into this very large kind of overwhelming almost ominous looking sort of uh, manufacturing facility uh, talk a little bit about that because you 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 told a story about that perspective because i was thinking like how did you determine how do you find that spot which seemed, looking at the image, and I haven't visited that place, and it probably doesn't look the same as you will, will explain, but it seems like you've found the most perfect place to put your camera and take that shot. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so that's, that's well put. Uh, that, that is, you know, and that's part of what's fun and part of the process is where do you plant the camera for sure, that perfect spot. And, and that involves a lot of careful looking uh, in that case, uh, and in the shell station as well, uh, the spot where the camera had to be, and I, you know, kind of determined it just by, you know, driving back and forth and looking. And then if you think it's interesting enough and you get out of the car and you take a small camera and you go and you sort of frame it in and you figure out what lens you're going to use, so forth and so on. Uh, yeah, so that that particular spot was, that is Mingo Junction, Ohio, and it's, it's along the Ohio River in a very kind of industrial area, you know, near, it's near Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. West Virginia is across the river. And it's just, um, to me, a, a beautiful little town because it, it has elements that I'm really fascinated with. I, a lot of this show, you, I, I would say, is kind of inspired by my love of industry and, and my love of industrial landscapes and my love of the people that work in these industries. So you'll see portraits and you'll see these, these industrial sites, but that intersection of kind of the town, the housing, the, the everyday stuff and with the factory in the same frame is kind of rare for many good reasons. 
Uh, and that, but that town has it. You know, the the, the factory, the factory we call it the factory, it's a steel, mill. and it's right kind of in. It's right behind Main Street, Mingo Junction, and uh, so that doing that shot involved um, stopping the car on a pretty busy stretch of road on a pretty narrow, uh, you know, uh, lane on the right, realizing that the police are probably going to come pretty soon and and kick you off, tell you to go, uh, and setting up setting up a, a view camera, you know, a four or five view camera and taking the picture and crossing the fingers. So, uh, and it's that picture, I think I told you when we were talking in the gallery is, is if, if I had, had to go to the grave and I had to have kind of one picture that represented me, that might be it. That's a really, really nice picture. It gets a lot of a lot of praise from people. It's the one picture I have that's in the Museum of Modern Art. So uh, that's that. I think is is one of my one of my great successes. You never know when you're taking them, whether they're going right. to be good or bad or different. Now you know. Back to the Shell Station for a minute. Um, I should say that I you know when I got serious about photography, the very late '60s, early '70s, and I studied with uh, took a color course with a guy named Len Gittleman at, at Harvard University's Carpenter Carpenter Center. And uh, at the time, documentary photography was black and white photography. We just didn't see people doing documentary work in color. And I'm not claiming that I invented that, of course. But uh, I was a very early adapter. And uh, so I started doing documentary photographs, mostly with a view camera. At the time, I always, you know, I always thought the bigger the camera, the better, because I'm interested uh, in subject matter, as Meg said, in detail. And you want, I want to render that detail as finely as possible. So I started doing that. And the Shell Station's taken in Arlington, Massachusetts. Not Arlington. Arlington. Not Arlington. But somewhere, you know, along, mm -hmm. I think it was Huntington Avenue towards Boston. And there, well, there it sat and it really grabbed me. It's, that's really an example of how sometimes you take a picture thinking one thing and you look at the picture later and it's turned into something entirely different, some, something you, you'd never expect to see. And that picture is a really good example of that. And you mentioned the, the deep blue sky. And uh, I photographed that, 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 I made that picture with uh, a tungsten balance film. And tungsten balance film is meant to counterbalance the warmth of light bulbs, you know, basically tungsten light bulbs. Right. They're all very warm color. And that film is designed for that. It's also designed for long exposures. So since I was doing long exposures, I used that film a lot. Well, when you uh, print that, that blue, because it's tungsten balance, becomes very intense. And that's something that I, I, that may have been the first time I really understood what was going on there. And it's something that I continue to, to use uh, in, in later work. There's a, excuse me, there's a picture near that, um, of this motel that's lit by pink neon. And mm -hmm. it's got the same thing where the, the sky behind it is this bright, intense blue. And you see the, the trees with their, you know, their, their, I think they're bare branches. I think it was, it was late in the season, so I don't think they were using trees. But anyway, you see, it's very nice. You see the doors, a few chairs, a room, uh, the sidewalk, a little bit of road. And it's just a really grabby image. And it's pink because of the pink. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up the, you know, you and I could rant about uh, seeing work in person rather than seeing it on a screen. Yeah. And I'm really bothered by the fact that I feel most people look at art on the screen, often a very small screen. And the difference in the experience of looking at a picture on a screen, which you're probably going to look at for one or two seconds. And being in a gallery surrounded by pictures where you can get far away from it or close to it, uh, and you just feel all of the pictures kind of around you is a very, very different experience. And mm -hmm. what I really, I mean, besides the fidelity part of the screen image, it's like um, it just doesn't encourage, I think it discourages deep seeing. You know, it's like when you're looking at art, you really have to spend some time with it. It's hard to do that. So, uh, and the other thing yeah. is that uh, that picture, there's a row when you go into my side of the gallery. I should say, by the way, that Meg 
sort of made a comment that I thought was really good. She said, well, she was talking to a friend. She said, well, my side's the boutique and Bob's side is the garage. So when you're on the garage <laughs> side, uh, there is a row of five pictures and they're all, the prints are all approximately three feet, four feet big. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are all industrial or industrial oriented. And that idea of, you know, part of the reason you shoot with a large format is so you can really see the detail. So you can go right up to those prints and you can look at the cars that are parked on the street and you can look at all the little stuff and it's all really clear and beautiful. And it's just a, a wonderful experience. So you can't do that with screen. No, you but can't. You can. uh, it's, a poor, it's a poor approximation. Yeah. I have to remind you, you're listening to WXOXLP in Louisville, Kentucky, 97.1 on the dial and RXFM if you're listening on a computer. Each day, nearly 100 lives are lost to gun violence in America. Whitney Austin, founder and executive director of Whitney Strong, was almost one of those lives, surviving a mass shooting while entering work. From that came the nonprofit organization Whitney Strong, which aims to reduce gun deaths through responsible gun ownership and majority supported solutions that are proven to be effective. To join their mission, visit WhitneyStrong.org and uh, come back and listen to Curious Curia on Sundays, another Sunday show uh, hosted by Aaron Hartley, an exploration of light, dark, and in between soundscapes. Curious Curia pits the experimental, noisy, and weird against the beautiful and ethereal Sundays noon to one. And, but I want to, you know, to come back to this, what you're saying, Bob, because when we were there together, there's this other image, which, and again, I don't remember the location, but it was another industrial town, mining town. And, uh, but the three of us, and this is an image you had shot. And I don't know how many times you've looked at it or printed it or whatever. And Meg must be familiar with it. I had, it was my first time seeing it. But, you know, and Meg was like saying like, oh, I never noticed this. We were, and it was one of those big prints that you took with a view camera and you could really just go in and she was finding things she'd never seen before. And we were all three exploring that image together and seeing things. I mean, even you were like, I, I don't know that you saw anything new for you, but you were still, it seemed like you were still as fascinated with being able to look at it that way. So I think that's a perfect example of what you were talking about. And it also sort of, you know, and I, I think I said to you about it, you know, particularly when you step back from, but even when we went in close, it very much was like a painting. There was something so very specific and intentional about that composition. And again, you don't lay out the town, you don't decide where the buildings are, but you pick that perspective. And it, it really bridges the gap between photography, which I think um people of limited vision and understanding would say like wow you just take a picture like what's artistic about that yeah, i want to say go look at bob howard's pictures and tell me you don't think that's art and that there's not the, the eye and the work of an artist in the selection and the time of day and how the light is working and all that stuff those pictures really come across that way to me um and it, they really say that i think very powerful well, thank you. Uh, I should also point out on that same wall, there are two very large, same size, large, three feet by four feet of mm -hmm. portraits. And they're, they're both worker portraits. They're both people that work in one in a steel mill and one in a coal plant. And, the, and they're very tight on people's faces. So it's a real, you know, kind of a head and shoulders view. And uh, the scale of them is, I mean, the, the heads are at least twice life size, if not yeah. three times. Yeah. And and they have this power to them. I'm not trying to take any credit for that really, but I mean, it's an example where you know you, you put in the work, you put in the time, you believe in something, and you know, uh, once in a while you get something good. So well, I think you should take some credit, but you also go back to what Meg was talking about, which is like the subject matter. Like you choose to go, you chose to go because those one was Germany and one was uh um, Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia. So you chose to be there exploring the, these different areas of the world and these different cultures, but the things that are similar to you, because you've done miners in Kentucky too, you did the sort of industrial landscape and the people that occupy those those spaces, you know, the, those really, uh, I've never done that kind of work, but I, I, I think I know how brutal and bruising that kind of thing can be. That's a rough life. So you, that's why those faces are so fascinating because they, at least to me, is because I'm very removed 
from their experience. So when their faces communicate that experience, that's what's meaningful. They don't look like my neighbor. <laughs> no, they don't. they don't. That's exactly the point. And, and you know, there's always a, to me, uh, somebody made a comment that, that those portraits and some other portraits that I had done, they look like art terms and, mm. of, of people in the way that, you know, so, you know, I think part of the appeal of them is they are a type of way in which you look at, that, at them and, and you see the individual, but you also see a, a kind of a bigger meaning. This is, they also, kind of, in a funny way, represent some part of humanity. And so you, you relate those to a kind of a bigger concept of what, what, what it is to be. Right. If you'd gone back 100 years and photographed a Czechoslovakian miner or whatever that was in that, in that same place and time, you might have found many of the same qualities. The image might not have been as technically <laughs> accomplished, uh, but right. uh, maybe, but you know, but it, you'd, you'd be dealing with maybe inherently the same people. Yeah. The same characters. Actually, actually, the helmet would be different, you know, and <laughs> the goggles would be different. There'd be a lot of different difference in the details. Yeah, absolutely right. And those are all the people that did that stuff back in the early part of the 20th, 20th century are my heroes. You know, so they're, they're the people that I aspired to be. It's funny when I was doing this, kind of looking at all of my images over the from really the in the show, the earliest one is from 1968 when I was in college and very green and ink. It's kind of a nice image, but a number of them from the early 70s. And I started thinking about this. I started thinking, wow. You know, you're basically you've been basically photographing our top five subjects. You know, your whole career. Right? Are you ever gonna finish with, you know, the the man and machine portrait? Are you ever gonna feel satisfied that you've done the ultimate factory shot? And it's like, now, you know, that's what I do. <laughs> and, and you think, wow, is that narrow mindedness, or or in, or is that something else? You know, is that just persistence? But it's kind of a funny thing to think about. You look at this pile of pictures and say to yourself, too, this is this is your life. This is what you've done. Right. Well, I, you know, you sort of touched upon this earlier, but Meg, let me ask you. You know, you're you you're arguably in a position to be like, you know, the, the most the foremost expert on Bob Howard's work. Right. Um, but was was there were there things about exhibiting together that opened your eyes or made or surprised you about seeing his work when he put it, put these images together in this context, you know, each other so well, and you know, each other's work so well, but were there surprises for you? Oh yeah. When I, I mean, the whole time, you know, I was here working on my part and Bob was in the studio working on his, and he was telling me about what he was showing. Um, but I didn't have, get the impact of it until I walked into the gallery. His show was her hung before mine. And um, it, it was so exciting because um, I just I just knew that it was like fantastic. And um, because he's Bob's a real craftsman and uh, his, his prints are always impeccable. Mm -hmm. um, but also I think, um, Going back to the scale of the images, when things are that large, they become environmental. You know, you feel like you can step into them, or you have this portrait of these people that are larger than life, um, and that's just a, a really interesting experience all the time. I mean, it's like what you were saying; we were kind of crawling around inside of those pictures. Uh, finding details and, and discovering new things, um, and I, and I think once again the the color of uh, his in his work. Um, I think what you know that first revelation I had when I saw Bob's work was that this isn't somebody just just shooting color because it's not black and white, mm -hmm. um, but has a real artist eye. And um, I think that's a way to kind of look at anything. Um, and I don't ask me to define what the artist eye is, but uh, <laughs> you, you know, I see, see it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, and then I was like, I came over to 
my side to the boutique side and um i was like i don't know bob's show is just like so full and you know he's just gonna upstage me and i have to so i came back and, and brought uh the next day i brought over several large pieces for Rita <laughs> to, <laughs> to fill it out but but that was good yeah um, to, because his works really stimulated me to want to have more of a, a large scale presence well that is good you guys aren't complacent about each other maybe the secret to a long happy relationship uh well bob let me let me get let me ask you the same thing where there's the, well, what about meg's work for you like were there did, did were there surprises were there did you gain different insights seeing it come together and you know because i think when people hang together and, and put work together i always want to know like what what happens what are the conversations that happen that putting the work together have so bob talk about meg's work a little bit and how what what you saw happening well um <clears throat> I had seen Meg go to Kenwin to, to take this course on that process of putting plaster on wood. And so you've got this, the part of it is it's got a three, it's not just flat, it's three dimensional. It can be three dimensional. She carves in the plaster. So there's an image where she had put a screen down and pulled it off and it's mm -hmm. right there. I'd seen all that work and she kept saying, yeah, you know, it's not finished. It's not finished. I gotta do it. Um, and then this opportunity came up and, and it kind of put a lot of pressure on her to, uh, to show these things, which I thought, you know, even in whatever form they were when she brought them back, they're beautiful and I just love that technique. So it was, for me, I don't know if surprise is the right word, but I spent a lot of time, I would come home from you know, doing whatever I was doing on, on, my, on the garage. I was in the garage while she's working in the boutique. And uh, I would come home and she'd say, you know, here's what I did today. And so there was a process of, and she would say, what do you think? And I'd you know, I, I, oh, it's always what she does is incredible. But I would say, well, you know, I think, you know, you need something here. You should change that color. Or what if there were, what if you put an eyeball on that bird? Or, you know, I would try to make some suggestions. I'd try to do a sort of a deep seeing and, and not only just love the work, but also see where I thought it might be. So for me, the show really was nice in that it, it forced both of us to do things we wouldn't have done. Otherwise. Uh, and we need to, you know, well, yeah. So I was going to say we need to tidy up our lives because we're not going to live for them. But for me, it was just great to watch the process, to watch her struggling with, I got to make work for the show and what I'm going to do, and just to watch it evolve. That, that was the whole thing for me, was to see how she went through that process and see what came out. Cool. Um, well, had you had you ever shown together before? No. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's that's what I thought. And, so and Eric thought that um, you know, when doing the show together, really, you know, put the spotlight on art making and all of the logistics and getting it done, and and it's been great, but. The rest of our time, our lives don't really, you know, we have, we have a dog, we have a house, you know, it seems like so much of our lives are, you know, wrapped around functional or practical things. And, um, but I think we do kind of entertain each other with, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I put all the colors for, walls and um you know bob is good at structural things i'm good at uh, color and texture and fabric um so all of that blends into our daily lives but um uh, and we love going to galleries together and um we love traveling and uh last summer we went to italy um, I was taking a, a course with Lori Doctor in Tuscany. And so um, we ended up spending three weeks in Tuscany. And uh, every day we looked for, uh, looked for art. I have a real proclivity for uh, early Renaissance uh, frescoes. And 
So, uh, and it was great. The Bob wasn't like, oh, we have to go to another church and look at these frescoes. He was, I mean, you know, it was great that our sensibility, especially around that, was uh, right on. Well, I'm afraid I've got to bring it to a close here. We're, we're, we're just about out of time. But thank you so much, Bob Hauer and Meg Higgins, who are exhibiting together right now. The show is called Nothing in Common. But uh, if you've just listened for the last hour, you know that that's really not true. And uh, that's at Klein Helter Gallery over in New Albany on 8th Street. So it's up through June 3rd. Plenty of time. Uh, the kids will get out of school. You'll have plenty of summertime. We should mention that we're getting- Oh, you're doing artist talk. We're doing a gallery talk on Saturday, May 13th at two o'clock. Saturday, May 13th at two o'clock. You can actually see these two guys in person. Um, and uh, Bob might have a little cane going on, but you know, whatever, we'll see. <laughs> um, I'll be there. He'll be there. Yeah. Oh, he's going to be fine. Um, yeah. uh, he looks great. I don't, you know, I, it's just a little soreness. Just didn't want to get out and cross the yeah, river. I understand. We, we can understand. get into that later. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd like to put a quick plug in for uh, Ray and Gina Kleinhelter and what a fabulous job they're doing in that gallery and how pleased we are to, to be there. We right. Have, it's just a quick trip across the bridge and uh, it's well worth the trip. Right, it is. Hey, I made it. <laughs> I made it over there. Um, so, yeah, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Um, so, well, thank you guys again, Bob Howard, Meg Higgins. You're welcome. Pleasure. Thank you, Keith. And thank you for everything you're doing in the oh. art community. Well, my pleasure, too.